apologies for the keystone effect. Um, I've got my camera tilted up a little bit, but there's nothing for it. I can't help that. Okay, now, I wanted to go over some of this information with you. This is very, very basic stuff. Now, I skipped over the mathematical part of this, and maybe we'll go back and do that later. But, atomic, this is a presentation on atoms and how atoms are put together and, and what they can do and all this good stuff. So, atomic theory and... There was a bunch of atomic theories from early on. You know, the Greeks back in the day, they thought all elements were made out of um, earth, air, fire, and water. Um, you know, they were, at least they were trying. You know, you can't really bust on those guys too bad because they did the best they could with what they had to work with. Okay, this dude Rutherford came along in 1911, and he was really the first one to kind of uh, come up with this idea that electrons and protons existed together, he wasn't really sure how they worked. He thought that the positively charged area of the atom, the nucleus, you know, was like a cluster, and then surrounded by just kind of a random cloud of electrons. Um, it turns out that he was, and you'll notice that, you know, it took thousands of years to get to this point, but then once we started kind of keying in on some of this stuff, the advances came really, really quickly. And we went from Bohr's model in 1913 to developing a nuclear bomb in 1945, which is, what, 32 years? Yeah, it didn't take long. Once we kind of figured out how these atoms were working, it was like, okay, well, what if we split this thing? Oops. Okay, so anyways, uh, Rutherford came up with his model. Bohr refined that some. He said, the electrons were actually revolving around the nucleus in fixed orbits, kind of like the planets revolve around the sun. You know, each planet has its own orbital track, and they don't overlap, or else there'd be a big problem. <coughs> Sorry about that. Now, he also figured this out, and this is very true. In a neutral atom, any old atom, as long as it's not an isotope, the protons, the number of protons always equals the number of electrons. So if you've got 74 protons, you must have 74 electrons. And I refer to that as the atom's ground state. That's what the atom wants to be happening. It wants to be nice and neutral and happy. And if something comes along to upset the apple cart, then the atom becomes unstable and it tries to get back into its ground state. Quantum mechanics are well beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about today, but it is theorized that even protons, neutrons, and electrons are actually themselves made of yet smaller particles that we haven't uh, exactly discovered yet. This, a lot of this quantum mechanics stuff is theory. We, we have good reason to think it might be so, but we don't know it 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, a little word about matter. Okay, what is matter? Well, there's a lot of things. Um, solids, liquids, gases, these are all forms of matter. Principal characteristics, these things all have mass. So if I pluck a, I don't know, like a, a molecule of oxygen out of the air, does that thing have mass? Yes. You know, it's really small, but it's, it's definitely there and measurable. And does it occupy space? Absolutely solids, liquids, and gases, they all occupy space. Now the structure of matter. Most things are mixtures. Um, there's multiple substances, like for example, if, uh, if I was examining, for example, this coffee cup. Okay, now, is this coffee cup made out of like, I don't know, elemental titanium? Is it elemental silicon? No. It's a mixture of all kinds of stuff. It's made out of ceramic. It's clay. You know, there's probably silicon in there, but then there's probably like little, um, a little bit of iron mixed in, some other minerals, um, magnesium, you know, whatever happened to be in the dirt that day whenever they were digging up the clay to make this thing. You know, so this, this is not uh, a single atom, of course. Uh, substances. Any material that has a definite and constant composition. So a substance is slightly different. Um, at, at its simple form, like if you had a chunk of lead, 
Okay, well then that is a chunk of elemental lead. It's a substance, we can identify it, it's lead. Um, there's other compounds, like for example water. Okay, what is in water? Well, it's hydrogen and oxygen mixed together in liquid form. It's water. It's not an element, you know, and it's a compound, but it can be referred to as a substance. What's in the air? Well, okay, it's oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and then some trace elements, right? Air is a substance. It's composed of a lot of different chemicals. But we're talking about elements primarily. An element is a substance that cannot be further broken down. If you have a chunk of iron, then that's what it is. It's a bunch of iron atoms. You can't break those down any further. I mean, iron is iron. If you start chopping it up, you know, like in a, one of those colliders, then you're not going to have iron anymore. If you break off protons, then you're going to wind up making some other substance. An atom is the smallest part of an element that still has all the properties of that element. So an iron atom is still going to be affected by a magnetic field. You know, it's, it's got the same properties as a chunk of ironwood. And here's something. There are 92 naturally occurring elements. There are 16 artificially produced elements. In other words, if we have access to the right kind of equipment in a laboratory, we can make our own elements. The problem is these things typically are unstable and expensive to manufacture. You know, you can't just whip this up in a high school chemistry set. Um, elements like californium, they can be made but they don't last long, they have a short half-life, and they're preposterously expensive to manufacture. So you wouldn't do it unless you had some really good reason for doing so. Now the periodic table of the elements, I've got one back here. Um, the columns, uh, the columns are referred to as groups. So you've got like the noble gases in a group, you've got the um, halogens in another group. These things are also arranged in rows, you know, periods, and you'll notice that the rows have some characteristics in common too. And these things are arranged in order of ascending atomic numbers, starting at the top with hydrogen. It's got an atomic number of one, and then we've got helium. It's got two protons, so it has an atomic number of two. Lithium is a three, beryllium is a four, etc. Okay, and the elements in the groups, like for example, if we look over at the uh, halogen group. We got fluorine, we got um, bromine, chlorine. These elements have some things in common. If you breathe them, they're pretty toxic, for example. But they also are very, very anxious to bond with other elements. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so elements in the same group. In other words, they are in the same columns. They have similar chemical behaviors and simi similar properties. Um, they also have the same number of electrons in the outer shell, which means that chemically they react um, kind of the same as, as other elements in that same group. And then elements in the same period have the same number of electron shells. They might be, you know, pretty different uh, in their action, but they all have the same number of shells. Okay, keep this in mind. The atomic number is also known as the Z number. That is just the straight up number of protons in that element, and it's identified in superscript. So it's, um, you know, there's a, like a little superscript two, and that's the atomic number. The atomic mass is a combination. It's the number of protons and neutrons and that's identified in subscript on the periodic table. Um, remember that the number of electrons is always the same as the number of protons. In other words, the Z number. So beryllium has four protons. How many electrons does it have? Four. You know, that's... Uh, tungsten has 74 protons. How many electrons? 74 unless it's an isotope and we haven't got to those yet, but we will. 
Um, electron arrangement. Maximum number of electrons in any given shell is 2 to the n squared, where n is the shell number. So the k shell is shell number 1. So 1 to the second power, 1 squared is 1. 2 times 1 is 2, because remember our order of operations. So the maximum number of electrons that can be in the K shell is 2. Okay, now what about if I add another shell? Well, the next shell up is the L shell, that's shell number 2. So how many electrons can it hold? Well, let's find out. If we put a 2 in for N, then 2 squared is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. So we're allowed to have up to 8 electrons in the second shell. And this keeps going up and up and up. You know, that obviously you can see this. Since we're squaring the N, as the shell numbers go up, the number of electrons they can accommodate goes way up. So, for example, if we're in the third shell, right? So if, the, if we're replacing this N with a 3, well, 3 squared is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. So we've gone 2, 8, 18. Now, who in the world engineered this? Why is it this way? I do not know. I wasn't invited to any of the design meetings. But I'm sure there had to be a reason, um, you know, for coming up with this scheme. Now, the basic atomic particles. In the nucleus, we've got protons and electrons. Protons are positively charged. Neutrons have no charge. Now, coincidentally, and you might notice this whenever you're looking at some of these elements, um, the electrons generally are said to have like very, and they do have some atomic, they do have some mass, but their mass is very, very small, right? But it just so happens that if you take a proton and an electron and you add their mass values together, it's almost exactly the mass of a neutron. So you can think of a neutron as being a combination of a proton and an electron together. And since it's got a positive and a negative charge built in, it's got no external charge. It's considered as neutral. So atomic mass, if we're, and this is just ballpark because it's not gonna be, a, it's not gonna be exact. Atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now, the protons are slightly lighter than the neutrons. So as you can see, as if you have a if you have a element with more neutrons, then it's going to pick up more total mass. So the numbers aren't going to be exact, but for our purposes, it's good enough to say atomic mass is the protons plus the neutrons. And then atomic number is just the number of protons in the nu nucleus, like we were talking about. Electrons orbit around the nucleus. They are in constant motion and they do not orbit in a they do not orbit like the planets do in a plane. They orbit in a shell. So as they're spinning and these things move preposterously fast. So they effectively like at the K shell, there's only at most two electrons there, but if you were to look at this thing under a super microscope, it would just look like a ball because those electrons are moving so fast that they appear to occupy all points in space simultaneously, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty darn amazing. So each shell, K-L-M-N-O-P, they all have a binding energy associated with them. So the binding energy has several different factors that affect its strength. The binding energy is determined by, number one, the size of the atom. And if you think about this, it totally makes sense. Larger atoms with a larger nucleus exert more gravity on their electrons, so the binding force is higher. And then the other thing is distance, distance from the nucleus. The closer an electron is to the nucleus, the stronger the binding force. So as, as we get out further and further in these shells, the binding force is much reduced. Okay, now, what causes these atoms to stay together? Why, what makes them so darn stable? Well, there's some opposing forces. Remember, these electrons are moving very, very fast. So what happens when something's spinning around a central core at a high rate of speed? 
well, there's going to be centrifugal force. It's going to cause that atom to be pulled away from, oh, sorry, the electron to be pulled away from the nucleus. But the attraction, remember, the, the electron is negative, the protons are positive, so opposites attract, so that force is going to hold the electron. So you think, well, okay, distance from the nucleus is going to have to be a balance, and that's going to be the point where the, the spinning force of the electron balances with the gravitational force of the protons, the, the nucleus. Okay, so right there is going to be your shell. Okay, that's, that's where we're going to settle. The closer the electron is to the nucleus, the stronger the binding energy and the more difficult it is to pull off of that atom. And here's a list of the maximum number of electrons in any given shell, and it's just that formula. You know, you can, for any shell, one, two, three, four, five, you can just plug in your numbers and make a computation. So it goes 2, 8, 18, 32, 50, 72, 98. That's a lot of electrons. Okay, so in addition to the number of electrons allowed. The outermost shell never contains any more than eight electrons. Again, why? I don't know. I wasn't invited to the meetings. So, like, even though... Hang on a second. Let me see if I can go back. Okay, so if you're looking at this P shell, now the P shell can hold 72 electrons total, but the deal is once the P shell has eight electrons in it, then it's going to start dumping some of those electrons out to the Q shell until the Q shell has eight electrons. Then once the Q shell has eight, then we can start backfilling the P shell. That's the way this thing works, as you're adding more electrons. And this is just like chemistry 101. You guys probably all know this stuff. Okay, so electron binding energy is directly linked with the size of the atom and proximity to the nucleus. And one of the most important elements that we talk about is tungsten. Tungsten is a big atom. It's got an atomic number of 74, so it's got 74 protons, and I forget how many neutrons, but it's um, you know pretty sizable. The electron binding energy on a tungsten atom at the K-shell level is 69 and a half keV. That's kilo electron volts. So 69.5 thousand volts. That's a bunch. I'm sorry, not volts, electron volts. Electron volts are slightly different. Okay, so binding energies. Remember, the closer to the nucleus, the stronger the binding energy. Uh, one, oh yeah, one electron volt is the energy one electron will have when accelerated by a potential of one volt. Okay, now here's some terms for you. Isotopes, an atom that has the same atomic number but a different atomic mass. In other words, we've done something to the neutrons. We've taken, we've taken away or added some neutrons and we've made an isotope. An isotone has the same number of neutrons but a different number of protons, so it's technically a different element even though it's, you know, it looks similar on the surface. Isobars have the same atomic mass but different atomic numbers with different numbers of neutrons. Um, so it's like the, the total number of protons and neutrons is the same. It's just that the proportions are different. So one has more protons and less neutrons, and one has more neutrons and less protons, if that makes any sense. And then isomers have the same atomic number and, and mass, but exist at a different energy state. Um, now, of these, the isotopes, isotones, isobars, and isomers, the only ones we're really worried about are the isotopes because those are the only thing we can make with our um, radiographic equipment and those are also important in nuclear medicine. Now compounds. Um, 
complex substances such as water, for example. Um, elements unite by either covalent or ionic bonding, um, like salt, for example. Sodium chloride is an ionic bond. So whenever you pour salt into water, what happens? Well, it immediately dissolves. It's not crystalline anymore. It's not a, not a crystal. It goes into the water and it dissolves. It forms an ionic compound. Well, that's good in a way because now that water will conduct electricity. That's one of the things about salts. When you put them in liquid, then they conduct electricity real well. Fun fact, if you want a fluid that conducts electricity the best, then what you're going to do is take some water and then pour in some sulfuric acid. Um, sulfuric acid, when it gets in water, it ionizes very, very strongly, and it is a powerful electrolyte. That's what they use in car batteries. All right, covalent bonding. This is sharing of the outer orbit electrons. Um, water is a good example of this. Remember, oxygen has six electrons. That gives it a valence of negative two, because remember, it can have at most eight in that um, outermost orbit. Hydrogen atom comes along, and uh, it's got a valence of plus one. It wants to join, because it's only got one electron in its K-shell. It would like to have two because that's just a more stable situation. And so the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atoms bond together and, you know, now they're uh, more stable together. You very rarely find elemental hydrogen in nature. Hydrogen wants so badly to bond with something that it'll bond with, um, you know, it'll bond with chlorine, it'll bond with oxygen, it'll bond with whatever it can find, you know, to just try to reach a more stable state. So you don't find a lot of hydrogen just floating around in the upper atmosphere. Okay, and then uh, salt we were talking about. Uh, sodium has one electron in the outermost shell. Chlorine has seven electrons in the outermost shell. If you put elemental sodium and elemental chlorine together, then it's going to be explosive. They want to join so badly that they're going to, um, there's going to be a reaction made. Um, and if you drop elemental sodium into water, same kind of thing. Um, the sodium wants to react with something so badly that it'll break down the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen, and then the sodium kind of muscles its way in there and forms sodium hydroxide. And it does it explosively. So, you know, if you're going to drop sodium into a beaker full of water, stand back and put on protective equipment. All right, some radioactivity. Some atoms are radioactive due to having an unstable nucleus. They've either got too many neutrons or too many, um, or not enough neutrons. They're constantly trying to change, you know, and in the process, they give off energy. So some things you dig up out of the dirt, like uranium, they're constantly in the process of breaking down and trying to become more stable. So just plain old uranium that you dig out of the ground is going to be radioactive to some extent. You're going to wave a Geiger counter over it and you're going to get a reaction. This is called radio radioactive disintegration or decay. Okay, um, radioisotopes. Uh, I can't remember what I wanted to say about that. They're not that important in x-ray anyways. Okay, now here's something that is important, ionization. Because every time we take an x-ray, we ionize the patient's tissue. We don't want to. I mean, we wish we didn't have to. It's just a, a side effect of making x-rays. So a couple different kinds of radiation. Particulate radiation are like alpha, beta particles, um, high-speed neutrons. That's particulate radiation. It is extremely damaging. But typically, the only time you're going to run into that is like at a nuclear power station where everybody wears all kinds of protection, so they're really not in that much danger. Um, or if you happen to be standing close by when a nuclear bomb goes off, 
then you're going to have a big issue with particulate radiation. There's going to be a lot of alpha particles and beta particles and gamma rays too. It's all going to be traveling at high speed and very, very high energy and probably enough to just burn you up on the spot. So electromagnetic radiation is what we use in x-ray. Now it is ionizing, unfortunately, but in return we get some good images. Now there are some non-ionizing um, energies that are used in imaging. Ultrasound uses sound waves, and as far as we can tell, they don't have any damaging effect on human tissue. MRI uses a combination of magnetic fields and radio signals. Now the radio signals don't cause tissue ionization, but they're kind of like microwaves and they will affect metal appliances. So if your patient has metal in their body, um, they might still be able to go into the magnet, but whenever the radio waves get turned on, a lot of times those metal appliances will start getting hot. So the, the patient may report some discomfort. Okay, discomfort is a physician's word meaning severe agonizing pain. All right, ionizing radiation. All ionizing radiation acts on biological tissue. Um, normally what winds up happening is we ionize the patient's tissue, we do some damage, but they very quickly recover from it. Their body can repair this damage. So it's not, uh, it doesn't wind up being that big of a problem. Um, particulate radiation, I'm not going to go into all that much. Just know that alpha particles, an alpha particle is like a bag of bowling balls that you're going to hit somebody with. It has an atomic mass of four. It has two protons and two neutrons bound together and when this thing hits uh, your flesh it, de it delivers a lot of energy um, in a very short amount of time. Now the thing is this big particle can't penetrate very deeply. It can't really get much into your skin but if you accidentally drink some irradiated water, for example, and it's got a bunch of, uh, and it's generating alpha particles, then it can damage the inside lining of your stomach. So that's how alpha particles can get you. You know, you breathe them in, or, you know, you ingest them somehow, and they get into your GI tract, and then they can cause damage. Beta particles. These things are... Uh, like electrons, um, as a matter of fact they really are electrons, but they're electrons moving at high speed and they're independent of a atom. Okay? They do have a charge, they've got a negative charge and the only difference like we were saying is their origin. Um, beta particles originate from inside the nucleus like whenever a, whenever a neutron splits it generates a proton and a beta particle. Remember that business about the neutron is actually uh, an electron and a proton together, in effect. So if you break one open, you get a proton and an electron. And we call that a beta particle. Now, beta particles moving at high speed, those things can penetrate human tissue up to a depth of 20 millimeters, 2 centimeters. All right, protons. Um, these things can travel at the speed of light. I'm sorry, not protons, photons. Okay, we're not talking about protons. Okay, X-ray photons travel at the speed of light. Um, gamma rays and X-rays are both X-ray photons. The difference is their point of origin. Gamma radiation comes from the breakdown of nuclear materials. Like if we have technetium-99, that we're using for nuclear medicine studies, that technetium is constantly breaking down. Its half-life is pretty short, and it's generating gamma radiation at about 150 keV. So a little bit stronger than what we use in X-ray most of the time. And X-rays are produced in electron shells, and we're going to have a presentation on x-ray production later, but you know, we're, we're going to get there one step at a time. Um, ionization is close to what beta does. In other words, it has about the same damage to your tissues, but the range on x-rays or gamma rays is unlimited. In other words, an x-ray can pass partway through your body, it can be absorbed by your skin, or it can go all the way through your body and come out the other side in which case it does no damage.
It's, it's transmitted radiation. All right, good deal. You all made it through my presentation. Thank you very much for watching this episode of X-Ray Education. I know it's kind of long. I'm sorry about that. Um, maybe I'll go back and redo it at some time and make it a little bit shorter. But hopefully this has been at least somewhat informative as far as the structure of atoms goes. All right, uh, thank you all very much.